Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Everyone. Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us if you just joined. We'll just wait uh, a few more moments until uh, everybody is in. Good evening, everybody. Hi, everyone. Right, okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think we will get started. Um, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Barney. I'm part of the operations team. Um, you may have seen me on some of the virtual tours if you've seen those um, covering for uh, Sarah and Kerry tonight. Uh, joining me, we have uh, Tom Mabbott. Everyone. Paul Stanbury. Good evening. And Ben Chappell, uh, all Hi, colleagues from our Mitch Tech team. Um, so tonight we are of course, talking about big cats. Uh, now, these are among the most admired and sought after mammals on the planet. And Nature Trek are proud to offer a broad and comprehensive range of big cat safari holidays. We offer expiring and truly memorable wildlife tours to enjoy sightings of all the world's iconic species in their natural habitats. This evening, our speakers will give you an insight into some of these species and a flavor of our holidays. Uh, so Tom will be talking about jaguar, puma, and a little bit later on, clouded leopard. Um, Paul will be speaking on lion, leopard, and cheetah. Um, and Ben will be covering tigers. Throughout the course of this evening, please feel free to send us any questions using the Q&A button um, at the bottom. Um, and we will either answer these throughout the course of the talks or at the end um, after all the talks are finished when we will have a bit of time uh, to answer those questions. Uh, we will be taking a break halfway through as well um, and we will let you know when that happens. So uh, without any further ado I will pass you over to Tom. Great stuff, thank you Barney. Welcome again everyone. Just share my screen with you all. Okay, great stuff. Whoop, we skipped on one. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Abbott. I'm sure you've, a lot of you may well have seen me speaking on other roadshows. Uh, I'm an operations manager for Nature Trek. I look after a whole range of, of, of tours around the world. And for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about some big cats. And I'm really going to be running through the itinerary for our, our South America's Big Cats tour, which during that one single tour, you can see these three stunning species here, Jaguar, Puma, and also in, in recent years, Ocelot as well. I'm going to be covering um, yeah, a bit about the itinerary, some other wildlife, not just these cats, and, uh, and just and what to expect from the tour. And then, of course, welcome any, any, any questions at all you have um, at the end of the show. So a little bit on the geography, this, this, this big cats tour to South America really is two holidays in one. So you, we, we start with a direct flight into Santiago and then we fly right the way down to the, you know, to the, to the southern tip of South, of South America, really right down to Punta Arenas down here in, in, in southern Chile. And then from there, we're exploring the, the Torres del, del, del Paine National Park for four nights. And then when we finished exploring there, which I'll cover the second half of the talk, we fly up to Sao Paulo, across to Cuyaba, and then we explore the Pantanal, where we're hoping to see jaguar and, and, and ocelot and a whole host of other species, of course. So a little bit, bit, little bit more of a close-up. So as I say, we spent our first night of the holiday down in Punta Arenas. Um, some nice birding and, and some wildlife um, chances there and just settle in. And then we travel up to the magnificent Torres del Paine National Park, where we spend four nights exploring this superb national park with the, with the real primary goal of, of getting close up, you know, superb sightings of, of Puma. And we have a, a really excellent chance of doing that. And then once we finish there, we have another night back in Punta Arenas before we carry on. 
So the National Park, the Torres del Paine National Park is, is really spectacular. Everywhere, whenever you're traveling through the park, you just it's just amazing view, scenery and spectacular view after spectacular view. It's, it's amazing, beautiful blue lakes and, and towering um, snow-capped peaks. It's, it's really a stunning area to, to explore and some, some very special wildlife. It's a, an extension of, of the Andes, so the sort of the southern you know, tip of, of the Andes. This is a um, glacier grey, so you can see a, an active glacier while we're there as well and, and, uh, and, and, and appreciate that. And, and just it's just an amazing place, tumbling waterfalls um, and, uh, and, and just yeah, in, incredible scenery as, as, we, as we travel around. And that's the, that, that, that is the focus. We're spending four days within the National Park um, as we, as, you, know, you know, our quest for, our quest for Puma. And of course, they're only visible really for, for a small percentage of our time. And the rest of the time, we're, yeah, we're enjoying all the other wildlife, some amazing walks and, and, and just you know, you know, you know, breathtaking views. Here's the classic sort of shot of the Torres del Paine National Park with the, with the legendary you know, three peaks where the sort of park gets its, gets its name with Gornacos here in the, in the foreground. Gornacos being a, um, a, key, a key prey item for, for Puma, of course, and a real help for us when we're tracking them with their, their alarm calls and, and listening out for them, watching their behavior. Um, and the, and, the, and the, the puma trackers are really you know, following the, the guanaco herds as much as as much as the pumas where the guanacos go the, the the pumas go but it's a it's a it's a, often a wonderful scene these large herds of, of guanacos grazing out over the over the, the grassland as we're traveling around we're, we're seeing um, a whole range of, of 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 wonderful birds i'm a big fan of my wildfowl and one of the real treats was was a, it was a numerous different species of, of wildfowl seen from Punta Arenas as we traveled to the National Park and within the National Park as well, a, a great range of species. This is a, a pair of upland geese, the beautiful white male here, and then I think the even more striking and beautiful female. And uh, they're very, very common as we're driving around, seen almost you know, you know, every day. Black neck swans um, here, uh, you know, really, really star species of the, of the area and, and quite commonly seen. And we'll see species such as a magnificent Andean condor. Just as we approach the park, there's some really towering cliffs. We've got a very, very good chance of seeing, of seeing the magnificent Andean condor. Just around our lodge, uh, when we were when I was when I was there in, in 2019 with the, the, the last group that, that, that carried out this tour, we had the spectacular Magellanic woodpecker pair just outside the just outside our rooms. This huge woodpecker male here with the bright red head hammering away on a, on a tree just outside our rooms. There's so much to see um, away from the, the big targets. On to mammals, that is the, that is the focus. We're always, we're always searching for, for, for mammals. That's always the, the primary goal. This is a Patagonian hognose skunk scampering around in the day, like more often seen at night. Um, and on this tour, we're getting up, we, do, we, we get up very early, we're often traveling to the puma sites in the dark. So we do some, a bit of spotlighting as well. And that's usually when this species is seen, but occasionally, uh, this chap was uh, was out in the out in the daytime and, and we had some some super views. So there's a few different mammals to see other than the cats. This is Andean deer, very very rare now. We were lucky to see this species. And guides often know the the best the best chances, the best areas to try and see them. That's very rare, very rare deer. We have a chance of seeing. So we're really going after everything um, with, uh, with 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 puma as the main focus. So as we'll be covering, there's there's lots of different ways of, of, of you know seeing big cats. That's the thrill of it. This as as Ben will cover with tigers, you know, you're tracking them and, and, and some it's sometimes it's scanning sessions, sometimes it's hide sessions. Um it's a bit of a, a bit of a, a mix on this tour. There's three pumas in this shot, by the way. I'll let you have a have a look to try and spot the three of them. There will be scanning sessions. There's there's times when we'll get to a vantage point where the, the trackers know that there's pumas in the area. And we'll scan with, with with the scopes and look for movement and have that you know the, the amazing moment when you when you catch the movement in the in the bushes and, and, and a puma appears and we'll also go on some walks as well the the, the, the trackers will know a, a, an area where they've seen them the night before resting and we'll have to go on you know really lovely walks to uh, to, to get within range and there's often a guide you know spotters up on the mountain sides around sort of guiding us to to an area so Every effort is made with, with, with trackers out all day and sometimes into the night, following the movements of these cats um, to give us the very, very best chance. And, and you, you, you really do need that. Um, and, uh, and we, and we, 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 hire, we, we, we use these, these amazing guides on, on the tours. 
We can get very close up views as well. So we'll have views as the previous slide showing fairly distant, you know, animals moving across the, 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 their territory, across the habitat. We'll also have you know, wonderful close up views like this. This was um, a very close encounter we had just from the roadside of a, of a, beautiful, a beautiful male puma. Um, these, these have a, the, the pumas have a very, very um, extensive range. So they get as far north as sort of Southern Alaska, right down to the Southern tip of, of, of Chile. Um, various different subspecies. Um, they're very, very adaptable cat though. They, they, you know, they, they, you know, they, they take advantage of what they can and they're not sort of specific to you know, certain habitats, which, is, which has led them to really you know, be able to inhabit a vast, you know, a vast array of, of different areas. Um, the the pumas in this in this uh, in this region are, are some of the largest um, subspecies, and as I said, they take down you know prey as large as guanacos, which is quite incredible. You may have seen on the on the recent one of the recent Attenborough series pumas taking down guanacos. Quite quite amazing how they bring them down. And they'll feed on other other smaller species as well, of course. As I said sometimes a walk through the grassland and, and go on some some beautiful walks. And get within pretty close range of these of these pumas resting in the grass. It's obviously staying a very respectable distance, scoping them. This is a photo taken with the phone down the, down the telescope, but just a, an amazing opportunity to study um, every detail of, of these of these very you know these these amazing cats. It's a it's a very special place. Probably my my last puma slide is one of my favourites. This is just a more of a, a distant shot of a of a female with a with a young cub sort of surveying there. Their habitat and a bit of a habitat shot here of just sort of the, the environment that you can expect to to see them in it's a it's a really thrilling experience and a very you know extremely rewarding way of, of, of finding these finding these cats often with a bit of a bit of walking involved when you get to the area where they are and you and you, you know that first sighting is it's it's a yeah it's a, a magic moment and we don't get out and see pumas after dark but um we found a when i was there we found a guanaco kill um, and often when they've killed a guanaco they'll return to it night after night after night until it's, you know every you know every part of that guanaco is every is, is eaten and uh, i thought i'd pop the camera trap on it so i always take a camera trap whenever i'm away tour leading so i'll try and hope this video works for you my best ever camera trap result this big cat <laughs> Lovely close up, licking the lips after a meal. There we go. And, and just one more. It's very interesting to find out. There's actually three um, pumas came in. It's just two shown in this uh, in this video, but th three animals approached, which is uh, we're thinking an, an adult and two and two youngsters. It's one of the first, as they first approach the kill, comes straight over to the camera trap. Amazing. I'm used to the hedgehogs in the garden, so to get a puma was a bit of a thrill. There we are. That's a rapid fire, very sort of scratching the surface, really, of the amazing experiences that can be that can be enjoyed down in the Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, enjoying pumas. And that's the, the part of the Big Cat Store. Also, we have a, a pumas and penguins tour, which just focuses on, on, on that amazing area of Chile um, as well. So from there, that's, that's just one part of the, of, of the holiday, of course. From there, we, we then fly to Sao Paulo and on to Coyaba. And then we're looking now to, to access from Coyaba this UK-sized wetland, which is, of course, the, the Pantanal. And which some some of you may well have heard me talking on before. And on our tours, we're we're covering really sort of the northern the northern area, a small area of the of the northern northern area of the Pantanal. And this is of course where we hope to uh, to go and enjoy sightings of of, of jaguar um, and uh, an and ocelot. So we joined the Transpantanal Road, an amazing 147 kilometer um, dirt road which runs all the way down to Porto Joffre here. And this is where we then access the the area with the world's highest jaguar density, and that's where we spent four nights on on, on this tour um, in this in, in this uh, area of highest highest jaguar density. On the way, we'll stop off at South Wild Pantanal Lodge, 
about halfway along the, um, the, the transpantin error. And then we stay there again as well um, on the way back. And there is just so much to see um, as soon as you join this road, as uh, some of you watching may well have visited the Pantanal before, as soon as you go onto the Transpantan area, it's just you know, wall to wall wildlife. It is, uh, it's wonderful. So I'm just going to run through some, some of the star species we hope to find with a focus more on the, on the mammals and, and, on the, and on the cats, of course. So this is the famous sign, might bring back some memories for some of you, this uh, the Transpantan area signs. And once you pass this sign, it's really you know, game on, wildlife everywhere. And, uh, and and just so much to so much to enjoy. We'll take our time travelling along this road on the way to on the way to the lodge, and just looking on you know, the side of the road. Any any wet areas, any pools, we'll often a scene like this. Lots of yeah, carry caiman you know, resting out of the water with a um, capybara there, just casually snoozing in amongst them, and it's just yeah, you know, just wildlife everywhere. It's actually really hard to progress along this road because there's just so much to see. You just stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Um, it's, it, it's amazing. Some beautiful, some amazing close-ups can be, you know, you know, can be achieved. It's a, it's a super tour for photography. Um, all these photos are, 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 are you know, from group members and, and leaders. And um, so, so some of mine, this is a, your carry came in eating a, eating a catfish here, really close up. And you get so close to these, to these animals. The wonderful giant anteater, of course, in the northern area, you know, end of the Transpantanera Trans Road. It's it's an open grassland, um, you know, cattle ranches, um, you know, dry ground, and this is the area where we're where we have a chance of finding of finding giant anteater. And we don't have a lot a lot of time on this particular tour to find them, but uh, there's always a chance. And and it's a, a, a magnificent species. It's huge, bushy tail, and incredibly adapted uh, species, which we. Which we, we hope to find. Jabiru stork, South America's tallest flying bird, very common in the in, in the wetlands here as we as, we, as we're traveling along Transpantanera and the sky is often full of, of, of birds. This is a, a big flock of snail kites, migratory species, pretty common in the in the Pantanal and just so much to look at everywhere, everywhere you turn really. Ring kingfisher, just another common species that we'll that we'll see um, on the you know in the roadside roadside trees and uh, and, and gallery forests. And we make our way to 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 the South Wild Pantanal Lodge for our for our first night in the in the Pantanal. So settle in, um, get our bearings before heading to the Jaguar core Jaguar zone the you know the following day. We can enjoy boat rides set on the beautiful Paxium River. Lots and lots of wildlife to enjoy, and uh, yeah, an awful lot to offer. In recent years, they've they've uh, they've, they've attempted a, a tapir out into a little open glade in the gallery forest. They pop down some uh, some mangoes and, and give it a little uh, a little treat every evening. It wanders out, and you sort of you can be sat in the sat in the in the lodge bar, and someone will give a give a little a call that the tapir has has, has appeared. And you can just pop your drinks down, wander a couple of hundred meters to this little open glade, and there's a, a tapir munching away on a mango right in front of you it's it's uh, yeah it's a fabulous experience we've got a very a good chance of seeing them just naturally out and about but it's 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 very cool watching this animal just come in and and have a nice little free free offering here's another little video it's worth tuning in this beats any tv tonight a point blank tapir munching on a mango beautiful and ocelot, I mentioned in you know, more in recent years, they've, there's there's an area where ocelot are, you know, are, are brought in. There's less jaguars in this in this area. Um, they're, 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 they, we, they, we still do have sightings. When jaguars come in, the ocelot will be pushed out straight away. And that's when there may be a few nights at the ocelot hide where the cat doesn't show. And that is you, almost always when a, when a jaguar has been recently, recently seen. And there has been groups sat at the ocelot hide and the jaguars just walk through. Um, but it doesn't happen often. We have a very, very high chance now on this tour of, of, of seeing ocelot, particularly with two bites of the cherry, staying at this lodge twice on the way there and on the way back, essentially. Beautiful, beautiful cats, stunning markings, obviously much smaller and slimmer than, than jaguar. And just small offerings, again, are, are put out, very small amount of, of chicken, and then the cat will come in, usually stay for a half an hour, 40 minutes, and then moving around and run to the high, which has got sort of low lighting, um, which enables you to have amazing views. Then it heads off and carries on with its natural behavior um, out in its, you know, out in the habitat. Of course, so it's a, 
a very privileged opportunity and, and it's, a, it's a really great experience um, of, to, to, to see this cat and uh, we will we'll make the effort to do that. So these these two areas to see the, the tapir and ocelot are pretty close together. So, um, you know, you can actually do that on the same evening. It's a yeah, super experience. Again, just one more little video, just to appreciate the, the beauty of an ocelot, stunning cat. just pausing before it came in to, to take the offerings. And again, the birding superb in the, in, the, in the grounds here, we have to have hyacinth macaw coming in, beautiful parrot, this amazing, powerful bill crunching through the, through the palm nuts here. And then we'll travel, we'll carry on traveling south down the Transpantanera. And as we go, the habitat changes, becomes wetter, these vast areas of, 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 of water hyacinths and more open bodies of water. Lots and lots to look at. Roseate spoonbill here with some black bellied whistling ducks. And again, just everywhere you look, there'll be striated herons, kokoi herons, capped herons, various different kingfishers, lots and lots to look at, and all often quite obvious. And um, you know, it's not, it's, it's quite you know, as dare I say, easy wildlife viewing. It's, it's gallery forest and open ground, so it's there's not a lot to sort of hide in amongst. Then we'll make it for, for our four nights of the, of the Jaguar Flotel. And uh, this is where we'll head out every day on morning and afternoon, um, you know, you know, outings on, on smaller boats searching for Jaguar. And this, this, this doubles as a research um, station. Um, the, the, the guys we work with, you know, stud, have studied the Jaguar for many years, recording every single um, cat, and you can obviously you tell the, the the different cats from the patterning of their of their coats, and uh, everyone is recorded and documented in a in an amazing um, you know, book here, and and uh, yeah, you can learn about all about the, you know, how many different animals there are, new sightings, uh, breeding success, and uh, and they do some great work with the local um, you know the local ranch owners, and we and, and sort of taking up lands and, and converting people from. Jaguar persecution to you know just showing the value of jaguars with, with visiting. So it's it's really great what they're doing there. And actually the, the numbers of jaguars in this core area um, seem to be steadily increasing. So it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, a success story and shows the value of, of, of tourism with wildlife. We had these are uh, the, the boats we head out on. Um, ideal really, but you know, everyone has a as an edge, so everyone has a perfect view, and you'll head out every day exploring this amazing wetland the different rivers and tributaries and channels, searching for a whole range of wildlife, whether it's black skimmer here with this amazing um, extended lower mandible. You might turn the next bend and see a flock of hyacinth macaws with some black vultures with them coming down to take a drink, or a king vulture perched up in a tree around another corner. We're appreciating everything. We're searching for jaguars and mammals, but as we're doing so, we're, no, we're enjoying every, everything we come across, of course. Yellow anaconda here using a hole that was created by a, a catfish. And when the water level drops, it leaves these holes, which the, which the, uh, the anacondas love to, to hide in. You might see tapir swimming across a, a channel coming down to cool off in the, in the, heat, in the height, um, heat of the day. It does get hot, um, of course, the, the right throughout the season from June to, to, to November, which is the season to visit the Pantanal. This tour runs usually in, in September, October time, it's hot um, and often the animals will come down and, and, uh, and, and bathe and, and take us enjoy a good swim. And it's also the giant, the giant otter zone as well, as well as the jaguar zone. Very, very high success rate. We've never missed seeing you know, family parties of giant otters and they're, and they're very, very approachable, um, munching through fish, often right next to the boat. But the reason we're here, of course, is to, is to find the magnificent jaguar. They'll hunt along these raised riverbanks they're exposed right throughout the season. And we're looking for these sort of pockets in the, gal in, in the gallery forest where a, a jaguar might be resting up, um, staring back at us like this, like this magnificent animal here. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's, a, a true, uh, it's such a special moment when you, uh, yeah, when, you, when you clap eyes from your very first jaguar. We have four nights, of course. We've got plenty of time each day to be out searching for them. We hope to have prolonged views of different animals um, and, and experience and, and watch you know, different behavior. It's not gonna be just fleeting glimpses. Um, as this photo shows here, this is a, an adult on the left and a, and a young animal on the right, 
having a tug of war with the poor old yellow anaconda. It's a real once in a once in a lifetime photo here. In, incredible um, behaviour, and we'll often witness mating. We'll, we'll see ad, you know, adults with young, um, often often hunting. You know, they often drop down. They'll they'll work along the raised riverbanks and throw themselves down onto you know onto unsuspecting caiman and capybara. Um, you know, quite a, you know, quite amazing the, the sightings that can be achieved. So every um, every uh, jaguar is named, and if you do happen to find uh, a jaguar that's never been that's never been seen before, um, you get to name it. And this this jaguar here was named by by a very you know, clever visitor. This is this is Mick Jaguar, um, the legendary caiman eater. Um, that's uh, very easily identifiable because he has just one eye. And last seen in 2017, I was you know, luckily to be, lucky to be over there in the last season. Um, he was seen a big big male jaguar. Um, and prolific caiman hunter um, that was that uh, that will now be in, in in Jaguar heaven, but a magnificent beast and was ended up you know, quite approachable and very very used to the um, the onlookers. Amazing cat. And then in 2019, uh, out there with the last big cats group that ran, we headed around a um, you know bend in the river. We headed north up to Query. We always try and strike out to the quiet areas. Um, this is a completely private sighting. we you know the flotel is. We're already in the heart of the, the core area, so we can strike off in different directions each day. And we bend around the bend in the, in, in the river, two heads in the water, two, two very young jaguar cubs. I've never seen such, such young animals before. It was a, a real thrill. And we just shut the engine off and just floated, keeping our distance and just watched what was unfolding. And we could hear the female calling um, from nearby um, and then managed to pick her up and, and see her anxiously looking across the, the, the river channel with these you know, piercing eyes calling for her, her, her young to come back. It was a, a magical experience. No one else around, just our, just our boat watching this, uh, this family of jaguars um, in the Pantanal. It was amazing. And like most youngsters, they take no notice at all of their, their parents. The two youngsters just bounded up the, up the, up the, uh, the sandbank on the other side of the river. Um, and, uh, and away they went, and we had, then we watched the female then swim across and and uh, and and, uh, and carry on after them. So that's just that's just one example of, of some of the amazing um, encounters you can have here. And um, our, our groups have never failed to have have some superb sightings of, of jaguar um, on on every visit. So once you've had your fill of jaguar, if that's if there's whatever, ever really such a thing as that, we're back onto the Transpantanal and we're heading back to South Wales Pantanal Lodge to to take stock of, of, of everything we've just experienced and, and, finish, and finish the tour. We have to go across over a hundred of these fairly precarious rickety looking bridges, um, but they are safer than they look. And we've, we've, we've not lost any, any groups into the water yet. And it's, uh, again, you can just see the habitat surrounding this road, um, stacks of, of, of wildlife to enjoy. So we'll spend one more night at, at South Wales Pantanal Lodge, taking some lovely river, river cruises, trying to see a whole host of other mammals, crab-eating raccoon here. I'm searching for for mollusks and other and other food items in a in a wetter area of the lodge. Crab-eating fox. There's lots of more unusual, lesser-known mammals to, to to go out and find. Maybe a southern tamandua, uh, an arboreal anteater, up in the you know, up, up, up in the treetops um, in the in the trees surrounding the lodge. There's lots and lots to see. Brown capuchin monkeys, very very commonly seen troops of them as we enjoy the, the, the river here. So lots and lots and lots to enjoy. Birding superb, sun bitterns displaying it often in, in some areas you, there'll be, you know, there'll be there'll be quite a secretive difficult to see species. And the Pantanal, they seem to be you know all over the place and a fantastic bird to enjoy when especially when they fly and show their incredible wing patterning. And lots of herons, a gammy heron here, beautiful mane-like feathering on the neck and this huge long dagger-like bill, just one of many herons we can we can expect to see so the bird life spectacular as well. All five species of, 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 the, of, of, of South America's kingfishers um, can be seen you know, with you know, fairly easily in, in one or two um, you know, boat journeys. This is green and rufous kingfisher here. Just, uh, just endless highlights really. Taco toucan coming down in the, um, often in the morning to the, to the, to the bird table. Another, another spectacular bird we aim to see. And we'll finish with another visit to the Ocelot Hyde. I say we have two bites of the cherry. So we'll head back down. It's a short, you know, 300 meter walk from the lodge. And uh, yeah, you have 
fingers crossed the, the ocelot will come in and, and pose beautifully like this for photos really really stunning cat and it'd be rude not to finish with another little visit to the to the tapir arena as, as well so um yeah it's great to stay there twice and have a have a have two chances at these amazing experiences so that's it for me that's a whistle stop through our pretty much through our, our south america's big cats tour and so much more than big cats of course um thank you very much for for listening i'll happily answer any questions afterwards and um i'm gonna hand over to to, to paul now thank you thank you very much tom thank you very much for an excellent talk um good e good evening ladies and gentlemen just give me two moments to share my screen Hopefully that'll work. Yes, right. Okay, hopefully everybody can see all that. Yes, good evening. Um, my name's Paul Stanbury, and I've been with Trek now for um, over 25 years. Um, and uh, I look after, like Tom, I look after a range of different destinations, um, and in particular, uh, Africa. So I'm going to take you across the Atlantic now from South America to the African continent and um, show you some, some places, some, some national parks and countries you can go to to see the three uh, big cats that live, uh, the, the cheetah, the leopard and, uh, and the lion. So yeah, where to, where to go? So I put a red tier on, on all the trees that we currently operate tours to in uh, in Africa, which will give you a chance of seeing one or more of those of those three big big cats. Um, some are better than others, and some you can see all three, and some and one uh, some others you may only see one or two. But today I'm just going to give you an overview, just of a couple of the the, the key destinations to think about if you want to go and see um, the uh, those three feline so Zambia, uh, Botswana, Tanzania and South Africa that's what I'm going to focus on over the next um, uh, 20 minutes or so. So as I say the three uh, big cats um, that live in Africa are the lion, leopard and the cheetah so here we have the have range maps for the three species um, the lion top left you can see here that it used to be a very widespread um, animal used to cover the all of southern Africa um, and round up into Morocco, across into uh, Turkey, Iran, etc. But of course, no longer exists in the vast majority of its range, and pretty much now is restricted to to national parks and game reserves. So there were over over a century ago, there were over, thought to be over two hundred thousand lions in Africa today there are about 20,000 20, left, so mostly conf confined within um, the, the, the national parks. Uh, leopards still have fortunately quite a, a, a much larger range. Um, they occur throughout central Southern Africa and um, in areas of Europe um, and, sorry, in Eastern Europe and India and Nepal. Um, and the cheetah has, again, a very fragmented range um, now. Um, and they're only thought to be around 7,000 cheetahs um, left. But whereas the most lions are, are, live within protected uh, areas, parks and reserves, it's thought that over nearly 70% of cheetahs actually live in um, unprotected um, areas. So they're a, a, a quite high high threat from um, um, problems with, um, with, with hu human interaction. So where would we go to to see these these are magnificent uh, creatures? So one of my favourite countries, I'm one of um, Nature Trek's favourite. We've we'll been operating tours to to Zambia for um, well over uh, a quarter of a of a century now, um, and in particular to the South Luangwa National Park, uh, which is cursor to work. It's down here in the south eastern corner of, of the country. Um, fabulous 
National Park, uh, centered along the permanent waters of the Luangwa River. Um, we fly into Lusaka, and then from Lusaka, we fly across to, um, to Mufui, and then uh, enter the park um, from there. Right, the computer seems to have frozen for some reason. One second. Right. Sorry about this. Right, there we go. Um, yeah, so the, the South Rangba um, is the, the home of the, of the walking safari. Um, they first started here back in the back in 1950s by the late Norm Carr. Um, and to this day, it is the place to go if you want to do, if you want to explore Africa um, on foot. So we do, we offer a range of different trips to, um, to, to Zambia, all of which offer the opportunity to do walking safaris and also to do more traditional um, vehicle safaris as well. The great thing about Zambia is the calls are open. Most of them actually do have a sunshade as well. I like the one shown here, but they give you a wonderful view of the of the wildlife and also a great for great photographic opportunities. Um, and in Zambia, we use this a really nice lodge. Um, the this is Kafunta River Lodge um, on the edge of the the Luanga River. Um, only takes about twenty people. Really nice, comfortable rooms. We also stay at another camp called um, Nkonzi Camp, a little bit more basic, um, but still very, very comfortable. And the South Luangwa National Park is just a fabulous um, reserve um, and a classic safari destination that will offer you um, the majority of the of the of the, the, the game animals that you want to see on a on a traditional um, African adventure. There are plenty of elephants in the reserve. There are giraffes, buffalo zebra, wildebeest, wonderful variety of different birds. Um, if you go between um, September and, um, and mid-November, you should enjoy the colonies of carmine bee eaters that descend on the, on the exposed riverbanks along the Luangwa River. So at their peak in August and September time, but there's normally birds lingering into well into November, an absolutely spectacular sight. But for those interested in, in the big cats, and this is what this, this evening is primarily about, it is also, also a fabulous park to go to, to, to see them. There are a very healthy population of, of lions um, in, in the reserve, plenty of, of leopard. There are no cheetahs. It is um, one uh, cat that the, that the park does, does lack, but you will see, you should see a good variety of, of a uh, good number of, of lions um, on the on the game drives. Um, and the, the lions, they favour a, a sort of a, a mix of open country and um, and light woodland. You don't tend to get them in the in in, in the more heavily forested areas. So the South Luangwa is, is a perfect um, place for them. It's also famous for its population of, of leopards, big male leopard here, uh, relaxing um, in, a, in a tree. Um, and it's one of the best places really anywhere in Africa to, to go to see leopard. If you spend a week in the South Luanga and not see a leopard, you would be um, ex extremely unlucky. Um, they are the most widespread of, of all, the, all the world's big cats occurring say, throughout Africa and up into Asia, eight subspecies um, in, in total. Very powerful feline um, can drag an animal larger and heavier than itself um, up into a tree. It's also um, nocturnal, so um, at its most active from, um, from dusk through to dawn. So in the middle of the day, if you're going to see, an, see a leopard, you'll often see them like this, lazing up in the trees, relaxing. The great thing about the South Rangwa is you can do night drives on every evening. You can head out with a spotlight um, and go out looking for, for cats and, and other wildlife um, um, after dark. And it does give you this is the, one of the main reasons why the South Rangwa is so good for, for leopard spotting. But as well as the leopards, there's lots of other wildlife to see as well after dark. South African crested porcupine here. 
So South Rwanga, fantastic park for, for leopards and, and wildlife in general. We do trips throughout the year um, um, at the end of the green season in, in April time and also October, November at the end of the um, end of the dry season. But another uh, wonderful um, country for, for big cats and other wildlife is, is Botswana. Um, and like Zambia, we've been operating trips to Botswana for, for many years. I do um, most popular um, itineraries, the 10 day Botswana's Desert and Delta trip, which is a mobile camping safari, landing in Morn, and then the time split between the, the Kwai concession and the Maremi game reserve. And then the longer Botswana highlights um, holiday, which starts at Victoria Falls in Zambia, then moves through um, Chobe National Park up into the edge of the Okavango and then back to Morn. Um, and that's a two week um, a two week safari. Both of these though give you fantastic um, chances of seeing um, all three of Africa's big cats. And Botswana is uh, it's as fat as a pancake in terms of its, its um, relief and landscape, but it's, it's uh, home to the fabulous Okavango Delta, the inland delta uh, that uh, fed by the waters up in Angola and fans out across the Kalahari Desert to create this incredibly lush, diverse and very uh, fertile um, habitat full of numerous, um, numerous animals and birds. In Botswana, we'll take you right out into the wilds and, um, and set up uh, mobile camps. So we use prior camping sites, so it's only the Nature Trek group um, in, in the campsite. Um, so the tents are, they're, they're, of course, they're more basic than Kafunta Lodge, which I showed you earlier, um, but still comfortable, proper beds, mattresses, bedding, pillows, blankets, and your own little bush loo um, out, out the back. So there's no need to creep out in the middle of the night with a torch, which you had to do about uh, 20 years ago when I first went to Botswana. Um, but today, every tent has its own little bush loo, bucket shower, and it's like basic but, but comfortable. So the camp staff will set up the tents for you um, and they do all the cooking and all the chores, of course. And at the end of your stay, they'll take down the tents, move them to the next site and they'll be all set up by the time you arrive. And the great thing about being out in the middle of the bush is that you're within, immersed within the, in, in the wildlife. You wake to this beautiful song of the um, white browed robin chat, the Huglin's robin, and head out into the Mopani uh, woodland. Um, cut by, by wetlands um, and marshes um, to enjoy the wildlife. There's another classic safari destination that's going to give you the, the, big, the big mammals um, and other wildlife that you want to see on an African trip. Plenty of elephants and giraffes, etc. Again, open-sided vehicles, so great for visibility, great for photography. Um, Botswana, again, has a very healthy population of, of lions um, and they are frequently seen um, um, in Maremi and Kwai um, and other areas of the country as well. Uh, leopards as well, again, common in, in, in Botswana, maybe lucky enough to see them up in a tree or maybe on a, on a night drive. You can do night drives in the Kwai concession, but you can't do night drives within the Maremi game reserve. Botswana also offers the opportunity of the third of the of the big cats, the, the cheetah, the, the fastest, fastest land mammal, um, estimated to reach speeds of between 50 to 80 miles an hour, although the at your highest measured speed, accurately measured speed of a cheetah is 61 miles an hour. Even so, fast, agile, beautiful, beautiful creatures. Um, and they like, they prefer the more open areas um, of, um, of the park. Um, and they prey on the, on the, on the smaller uh, antelopes um, that live there. Um, for those in predators, then as well as the cats, you have the dogs. And Botswana is one of the best places, really, anywhere in Africa to to look for um, African African wild dog. And there are packs that live in the Marimi Game Reserve and and quite and uh, and a scene. I would say by by the majority of our groups, of course, being wildlife, you can't guarantee any every anything, but you're having a very good chance. Wherever you've got the predators, you've got the scavengers as well. Plenty of spotted hyenas. Some beautiful birds such as uh, lilac breasted roller. Um, and then you can extend your tour and fly into the heart of the delta. Um, you take a light aircraft for more than 20 minute flight will take you right into the heart of the Okavango Delta, um, where there's some 
really lovely small depleted lodges to to stay at. so it's very easy for us to tag on a few nights in the Okavango for anybody who's interested it's the lodges i think it's i think it's, i think it's guns camp i think guns camp or Marimbi crossing um in the one of the wetter areas of the park and you do macora rides walks and some of the drier areas you do game drives as well again Good opportunities to, to look for for big cats. There are lions that live out in these wetter areas of, uh, of of the country, as well as in the drier regions, and leopard out here out here as well. Um, the Okavangas, the drier islands, and the Okavanga are particularly good for uh, for seeing leopard because there's lots of prey out here. And on the wildlife, if you want to see um, pels, the wonderful pels fishing owl, uh, one of the largest owls in the world, then a trip out into the Okavango is really the, uh, the place to go. Uh, moving south in Botswana, they uh, leave the influence of the Okavango Delta behind um, and you move into the drier Kalahari uh, region. We do a trip down to the central Kalahari game reserve as well, another camping, mobile camping trip. Um, very, very different habitat, much drier, um, plenty of Gemsbok and Springbok, this is the home of the um, the famous black maned lions of the of the Kalahari, uh, which prey on the on, on the Gemsbok and, and and other ungulates. Um, there are lots of springbok around, and springbok are the favoured prey of the cheetah, and, and the Kalahari is perfect cheetah habitat, very flat, quite open, and good um, uh, ground for the for the cheetah to, to to run and sprint after its its prey. So there's a good population of cheetah down in, in, in the Kalahari. And only anywhere in Africa, when you're away from the cities, away from the night pollution, the, the night skies are just spectacular. And in the Kalahari desert, um, it will take you out at, at night to, to admire this spectacular um, scene of the, of the Milky Way stretching overhead. And I'm just crossing the continent over to, uh, to Tanzania. Um, Tanzania and, Ke and Kenya as well, another couple of fa uh, fabulous destinations for, for big cats and, and other wildlife. Um, in Tanzania, we have trips that do the, the, the northern circuit, so Serengeti and Gorogoro Crater, and also down um, to Sulu down in the south. In Gorogoro Crater, one of the one of the world's great natural wonders, but it's also home to about 70 odd lions. Um, and um, throughout Tanzania, there's of course plenty of plenty of game um, for the for, for the big cats, including um, uh, um, over a million wildebeest in the Serengeti and hundreds of thousands of um, of of zebra and other and other ungulates. So, um, yeah, provides great hunting for um, for for prides of lions um, and also for cheetah. Um, Tanzania and the Serengeti is one of the best area, best places really anywhere in Africa uh, to look for cheetah. Um, they quite often take up this, this um, characteristic uh, pose on the top of a termite mound um, to where they can survey the savannah for, for prey and, and predators. On the trip I did several years ago, we got exceptionally close views of cheetah when a mother with two large cubs decided that instead of climbing the nearest termite mound, they would climb onto our safari vehicle. So the mother sat on the on the bonnet and the two youngsters sat right on the very, very top of the vehicle. So it's quite a, um, a surreal experience sitting inside the vehicle um, and looking up into the eyes of these two large cubs looking down at us and the mother out on the bonnet. Um, and although not a big cat, if you're interested in seeing the other cat species, Tanzania is a great place to go, in particular for servals. We probably see more servals on our tours in Tanzania than um, anywhere else in, in Africa. So the Ngorongoro Crater and the Serengeti being two particular areas for them. So now down to the southern tip of Africa, down to South Africa. Well, I couldn't um, um, not talk about uh, big cats in, in Africa without mentioning our South Africa Just Cats itinerary. And this is a very popular tour that, as the name suggests, focuses on, on the big cats of, uh, of South Africa um, by taking you to Kruger National Park, um, one, of, one of the finest um, game reserves on the whole of the continent, and also going across to the neighboring private reserve of, of Sabi Sands, um, which sits right on the very edge of Kruger. Um, 
again, from safari destination with all those classic um, African um, um, game animals, giraffes, zebras, elephants, impala, buffalo, etc. Lots of game, of course, for the, um, for the cats. There's thought to be over 1,600 lions in Kruger, so it had one of the densest populations of lions really any, anywhere in Africa. Um, and there are also lions in, in the neighbouring Sabi Sands as well. Both cheap um, occur here and leopard and Sabi Sands in particular is, is famous for its habituated leopards. Um, it's one of the best places um, to see leopards during the daylight as well as during the, during the night. So if you're particularly keen on seeing leopard, Sabi Sands really is a, a, a great place to go. And I'd um, say lots of other game as well. Um, white rhino, uh, an increasingly rare animal, sadly, in, in Africa, but Kruger still holds a, a pretty healthy population of this magnificent creature. And South Africa is, an, is a great place to go looking for other cats. Um, there's the, 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 um, the caracal, um, the uh, a, a cat that likes the, 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 the sandy deserts. And we do a, a caracal tour now, one that take you to the, the Cape area of South Africa in search of this magnificent, very, very elusive um, feline. And just a couple of um, images just to, just to demonstrate there are also big cats in some of the other African countries that we, we, we run tours to. So if you want to see the, um, the, the, the lions of the Namib Desert, then of course Namibia is the place to go. If you want to see lions, Lay, lounging in, in trees, then maybe Queen Elizabeth National Park in, in Uganda. Um, we could even cross continents as well. So lions are restricted pretty much now to Africa. They used to occur right from Africa across into Asia, but there is one small remnant population of Asiatic lions left in the Gear Forest in this Indian state of Gujarat. Um, unfortunately, these, these are one of the lion populations that are actually on the increase. And there were 180 lions in 74. There are 400 in 2010, and now thought of around 650 or so, still restricted to this, this one reserve in, in India. Um, there's also plans as well to maybe even introduce um, cheetah back into, the, um, back into the parks of India, which would be um, a great thing to see. Um, and leopards as well, there are the eight subspecies of leopard across the world from, from Africa up into um, Arctic Russia. But in, 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 on the Indian subcontinent, you have the Indian subspecies, a little bit smaller, but they have larger rosettes um, um, patterning on the, um, on, on the, on the fur. Um, and if you're very lucky, maybe even a black panther. And there um, we do a trip to Nagahol Reserve in India, um, where you'll stand a reasonable chance of seeing the black panther, which is a, a, a melanistic form of the leopard. So, so I, I've overran slightly, so I better, better stop here. Um, so thank you very much um, for, 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 for listening. If you have any questions at all on any of the um, African trips um, and um, African big cats, then please let me know. Um, and now we're going to break for, um, for just for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll be back um, listening to to Tom and to and to Ben. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm Tom, of course. And I'm now going to take you to the island of Borneo, and just I've got around ten minutes to try and sort of cover our, our tour that goes in you know, a, a quest for the for the clouded leopard. It's it's uh, I'm going to be focusing on our on our holiday to um, to the, the Dramacot Forest Reserve. So this is this is the island of, of Borneo, of course, the, you know, a huge rugged island, the third largest island in the world. And we focus our all our itineraries um, to we have you know, four different itineraries to to Borneo, and they're all in in Sabah, the, the, the northeastern Malaysian state of Sabah. And just a little bit of the geography, some areas you you may have heard of or of course visited. So we we fly into either Sandakan here or or into Kota Kinabalu. And, and here's some of the, the famous reserves, the, the amazing and, and vast Tabin Wildlife Reserve down here, not far from Lahadatu. Um, we have the, the Sepalok Forest Reserve, not far from Sandakan, the famous um, Borneo, re, uh, the, the Orangutan Rehabilitation uh, Centre, Danon Valley Conservation Area, Mount Kinabalu. So these are some of the famous national parks and of course the Kinabatangan River. 
that runs right through Sabah there. I'm going to be focusing now on, 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 a, on a more recently um, visited uh, reserve. The Dramacot Forest Reserve is, is just south of, of, of the town of Tulupid, which is around, around here. And it's, a, and it's the reserve we visit um, to really go after some of these really unusual, nocturnal, amazing mammals in Borneo, including the ultimate target being, being the Sunda clouded leopard. Um, of course, and 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 chance of, of other cat species, which I'll which I'll cover now, fairly quickly. So Dramacot is is a is a working forestry reserve. It's it's won awards for actually for its you know the, the sustainable way it's gone about managing um, the forest here. So there's very very selective logging um, done every sort of thirty to forty years in certain areas on, on, in a rotation, and it's shown to you know, to really you know, maintain its its diversity and and, and certain species actually shown to, you know, to benefit, including possibly even the clouded leopard, which um, thrives and, and feeds on, on some species that actually like a, a few more sort of open areas. So it's an interesting study going on there. So it's, it's, a, it's an amazing reserve. And this is a photo um, taken from one, of the, from one of the logging tracks. You can see some, some, some fabulous forest. This is an aerial view. So we stay at these two um, chalets. It's not, a, it's not a place to visit for a, for a luxury lodge stay. You're visiting Dramacot to to access an amazing reserve for many, many hours, um, often during the night to try and find some spectacular species. They're air conditioned, perfectly um, clean and comfortable, but it's not, a, it's not a luxurious lodge at all, but it's, it's a fabulous place. And just exploring around the grounds in the daytime, you've got chance of seeing some superb birds. A whiskered tree swift here, what a, what a stunning bird that is. The tiny Bornean falconet is the smallest raptor in the world. So it's, it's, it's remarkably small. When I first saw it, I just thought that is, it's, it's ridiculous that that's, a, that that's a raptor. It feeds mainly on, on, on butterflies, a tiny little thing, uh, about, the, it's about the size of a bullfinch. Um, yeah, beautiful little bird and a, a couple of pairs nesting around the grounds of the, the lodge and just some nice relaxed walks in the, in the daytime. Um, as you can see a whole range of different species. The much bigger um, red bearded bee eater is a fairly frequent sight on, on wires and in, in trees around the lodge. And all eight species of, of Borneo's um, hornbills have been, have been recorded at Dramacot. This is the rarest of the eight. This is helmeted hornbill with this huge cask on top of the bill here and the really long um, tail feathers. So, uh, yeah, lots and lots of fabulous birds to, to go at. And in the daytimes at Dramacot, we spend seven nights here. On our on our born on our on our mammals tour, we start with a night um, just to get over the flight at, at Sepalok and to visit the Orangutan Rehabilitation Centre. We then spend seven nights at Dramacot, really focusing on the night time and just relaxing and taking leisurely walks in the day, and then finish with a bit of relaxation, and more of a leisurely itinerary with three nights on the Kinabatangan to, to to finish the tour. So it works works very well. A, su a superb trip. Again, a good population of, 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 of orangs at Dramacot, so it's, it's a very good tour to choose you know, if, you, you know, if your heart is set on seeing, seeing, seeing wild orangs. You'd be very unfortunate not, not to see one in the wild on this, on this trip, whether it's at Dramacot or on the river. And this big male here with these big sort of facial flanges, they, 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 they call them an absolutely incredible animal and, uh, and a good chance on our, on our sort of you know, walks in the day and, and evening and early morning drives. Gibbons waking to the sound of of, of gibbons uh, calling in the in the Bornean rainforest is a it's a very very special uh, experience and they will move through the trees and they'll they'll they'll, they'll leap in towards the the, the the fruiting fig trees it's often the way of finding you know, your, the, a fruiting tree and just keeping your eye on that for the week and uh, and, and you know, see so many species coming into it birds and mammals uh, um, alike you know finding their way to these to these fruiting trees they rely so heavily on the on the fig trees in Borneo. Good chance of, of, of pygmy elephants um, in, in, in Dramacot in the, in the approach roads and the, and the tracks um, around the lodge and, and sometimes even seen on foot when, when walking on some of the trails. But as I say, our time is really focused on, on getting out at night and we'll, we'll use a vehicle such as the one um, pictured here, an open top vehicle, and we'll tour around the reserve covering the various different, uh, uh, different tracks and areas of the, of the, of the reserve in search of wildlife. We have uh, the opportunity here to spend up to seven hours um, a day, sometimes more, 
taking taking you know nighttime safari. So that will be split with maybe a, a, an early evening and then um, you know, drive and then some after dinner. Or sometimes we'll have dinner and then just go way on into the night with obviously breaks, of course, to stop and have have tea and coffee, you know, broken up. But we've had a long time to get out um, and uh, and explore the reserve after dark. And there's so many amazing species. I'm just going to cover some of the amazing wildlife uh, that can be found. This is buffy fish owl. This is a species you're you know, see, see a lot of. They like the wetter areas, dropping down to feed on um, you know, fish and frogs, a very common sight. And any spotlighting in Borneo, you're, you're almost sure to see an array of different um, different civets. This is uh, Malay civets. This is, this is often seen on, on the ground. Um, you know, the, probably the most, most commonly seen, really striking you know, black and white markings on, on the neck. And there. Uh, Spotlighting up in the, up in the treetops, or you, you may see a Bornean striped palm civet. So unlike the Malay civet, this is almost always up in the up in the treetops. It co covers that niche, this really long tail, perfect for balancing and working through the treetops. And again, we're shining. When I'm saying spotlighting, I'm saying we're we're shining a, um, a, a a torchlight to to catch the eye shine of these these animals and uh, and, and have a and hopefully have a good look at them um, before they move away. And again, it's often finding those fruiting trees as animals up in a, up in a fruiting tree feeding away. This is the bizarre otter civet. So it really is a bit of a cross really between an otter and a civet, big, long pointed, uh, pointed snout, very long um, whiskers, um, ears that will just close up when they're hunting underwater. And so it's a really bizarre animal, very rare animal, but our groups have seen them at Duramacot um, on a number of occasions, often after a bit of rain, and when there's some muddy channels next to the tracks, uh, we might we might get a chance to see this rather bizarre, uh, an amazing mammal. There's so many species here to enjoy. This is the binturong or bear cat. So one of my photos here. Again, these are all photos taken on on the tour. It's a particularly fuzzy one. You can just make him out here resting high up there in the treetops. A big sort of hairy civet. It's a it's a it's a quite a yeah a bizarre animal. Again, um, really favouring the fig trees and will return time after time to those trees. To, uh, to to feed amazing animal this is one of my favorites um the the the, the kalugu an absolute master glider so they've got these big uh, folds of skin and they'll work their way up a tree and then glide often for you know i've been recorded to glide over 100 meters just gradually descending um and and just to move around their territory that way you can just see the little youngster's head sticking out here um from this kalugu they're fairly frequently encountered really really cool mammals and uh, yeah, always a, always a thrill to find them. One of one of one of my favourites. There's just so many so many mammals to, to encounter, and obviously we're 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 targeting. We're trying to find the the cats, but as we're doing so, we're seeing so much uh, so, so many different uh, species. This is this is a moon rat, so it really is a just like a large, pure white rat, more closely related to to hedgehogs, in fact. And they they again like these very wet ditches, feeding mainly on earthworms and um, and other insects love these wet ditches. We're really fearless. Sometimes, if you, you know, if you if you find one, they'll they they won't move away. They they they've got a very distinct, strong, pungent smell. You can sometimes smell them before you before you see them. Um, and if you were to you know, you know get down or anything off the vehicle, they often they don't run away. They're they're, they're quite they're quite aggressive things. This is the, the the rather bizarre moon rat. Western tarsia, amazing amazing photo here of a western um, tarsia. These big sticky pads on their feet and they sort of spring from tree to tree to to, to prey on, on on large insects uh, mainly in these huge eyes they're actually very difficult to spot uh, in in the in the spotlight you get the spotlight on them and their eyes sort of glow a very dull sort of red and they'll often quickly turn away from the light so they're they're tricky to find but when you do you can often have some incredible views um such as this an amazing photo of, of western tarsia this is a, a greater mouse deer out on out on one of the tracks at Dramacot, and this is a key prey species for you know, for, for clouded leopard, and they've got a very high population here. They like the slightly some slightly open areas. They like the tracks to come out and graze on some fresh um, you know, grass growth, and and with this high level of you know of, of prey items, you know, the clouded leopard sightings are as frequent at Dramacot as as, as any other reserve um, in, in in Borneo. Um, so this is the 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 you know the greater mouse deer. There's also lesser mouse deer. And these deer are, are very small. They're I mean they're barely larger than a than, than, than a large rabbit, really. Um, very, very small deer. Um, the, 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 the cats prey on. So I'll move on to the cats. There's five um species of wild cats in Borneo. 
This is the, the, the leopard cat. Um, this is the most frequently encountered uh, species. Beautiful cat, about the size of our domestic um, domestic cats um, here. Um, you know, they, they will inhabit sort of broken forests as well as, as, as primary forests. And uh, you know, very frequent, frequently encountered, you'd be very unlucky to, to not see leopard cat on, you know, on, a, on a visit um, with so much spotlighting as, as we put in. Another is, is marbled cat. This is a photo from a tour of a, of a beautiful marbled cat you can see here resting. Um, very much arboreal, they'd often hang around outside flying squirrel holes, waiting for them to come out to, to, to prey on a really big bushy tail and a, and a very distinctive, um, you know, fantastic species. A rarely seen species, but you know, with the amount of time that we're spending at night, um, we, we, we give ourselves you know, every, every chance. This is flat-headed cat. Um, another another amazing species, very much an, you know, an, an aquatic cat. They'll feed you know, in and around water. Um, a fairly uh, flat head, but it's mainly their the, you know, their attributes of being a, an, an aquatic cat. And you get near water, and you, and you have, a, have a chance of finding them. Again, rarely seen. But then we have we have succeeded on a, on a few of our tours of seeing flat-headed cats. And the other species is is bay cat, which is near mythical, and we, we haven't seen. So that's that's four. And then, of course, the ultimate target on this trip is to is to encounter sunder clouded leopards. So it's a different species. Back in 2006, it was um, classed as a different species to the to the mainland clouded leopard, and uh, and uh, this with a slightly different patterning. And this was the first um, view of one walking towards a group at Dramacot. Mouth agape, they have um, glands in their throat that that, that sense their sense their prey. They often have their mouth agape like this as they're walking, just covering their habitat. And we're hoping to basically intercept a cloud of leopard as, it, as it's walking its, its habitat on these forest tracks. Amazing shot here of the, of the big canine. So they'll, 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 they'll take their prey by biting the, the back of the neck. And um, they feed on a, a, a wide range of species. The males are, are larger than the females. They'll feed largely on the ground. Um, but uh, but also the, the females being a bit more nimble will also hunt in the in, in the canopy and guides there say they they've witnessed a um, clouded leopard taking it taking down um, an adult orang um, orangutan which is quite quite incredible falling from the from the tree so they're yeah you know, you know, remarkable um, remarkable species and they will they will kill with this with this bite to the neck with these impressive canines. This is another, you know, this photo taken on our on our tours, just an animal walking right past the vehicle. It seems when we do find them and they're on their course, they will not be put off by, you know, by our presence in the slightest. They'll walk right the way past um, the vehicle. This one's pausing to give us a look and then and moving on its way. And you can see here why they're called clouded leopards. These these you know, cloud shape markings on the on the legs here and then the markings on their fur. Beautiful, um, beautiful animal. And just one final shot, again, par passing a vehicle um, and just shows this really long tail, perfectly adapted for, for, for moving through the, through, through the trees and through the canopy where we, so we have to keep our eyes, um, you know, peel for them on the ground and, and resting up and, and, and in, in the trees as well. It's a, it's a, it's a great challenge. They're not, you know, not at all easy. There's no set way of, of predicting um, a sighting. It's just putting in the hours trying to intercept one, enjoying everything you see along the way, and, and fingers crossed um, to, to intercept one working its territory as we, as we have done um, on, on a number of occasions. Amazing cat. So I don't have long for, for, to cover a clouded leopard. I always finish on this slide for Borneo, for, for Borneo Talks, just to, just to show some pristine rainforest. There's a lot, an awful lot in the press about the deforestation, and it's an incredibly um, you know, deforested, um, island and, and, and you'll see signs of that when you visit but there are these amazing pockets and these amazing reserves that still have pristine primary intact forest and it's only by visiting these areas that, that uh, really keeps them that way um, and shows the value of the wildlife there so there's some amazing reserves and I, I highly highly um, recommend a visit and we've got yeah, four super itineraries to, to Borneo. So I'm just going to tag on a few minutes. We 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 haven't got the the, the experts for, the, for our snow leopard tours in tonight, but I just wanted to it wouldn't be a, a big cat's night without at least touching on snow leopard. We have two tours um, in search of this amazing amazing cat, and I'll just very very quickly quickly cover those. Although I'm 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 no expert myself. We have a tour to the to the, to the mountains in Mongolia. So this is a a shot of of, of 
people are scanning the, 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 the mountainsides here for, for snow leopards in Mongolia, working very closely with local trackers that will, that will have uh, followed their whereabouts and our groups um, you know, get out and, and, and track them and, uh, and hope, to, hope, hope to spot a snow leopard on, on scanning sessions and, and scanning vast areas. We'll stay in, in yurts like this, large tents, um, sort of temporary camps, out in the out in the, the, the more mountainous areas of, of, of Mongolia as, as we search for them. And we also have a tour to, to Ladakh, a little bit more extreme in Ladakh, more hiking involved and, and, and wild camping, but spectacular scenery and, uh, and, a, and a fabulous chance to, to, to see to see snow leopard. So the cat up here in the top left, looking down on some on, on blue sheep um, I'm down here and, uh, and, a, and a, an amazing encounter. And just shows the camouflage of, the, of these animals. A real challenge to pick them out, but we work with some amazing guides locally who have been tracking them and know of their whereabouts and, and have, a, have, a, have a super chance. So slightly easier going, less taxing away in, in Mongolia and then in, in Ladakh, a little bit more, a little bit more extreme, but uh, incredibly, inc incredibly rewarding. So that's about it for me. I've overrun a little bit, Ben, there, but we'll, we'll eat into the Q&A um, session a bit, which, uh, which shouldn't matter. So I'm going to pass you over to Ben now. Who's going to uh, cover the, yeah, the the largest of the more tigers? Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope. Let me just see if I can start this quickly. Um, Great. So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ben Chappell. Um, I, I was a full-time employee of Nature Trek until last year, but I am now primarily based at the Zoological Society of London uh, and at Imperial College. Uh, and in my sort of day job, I uh, do research on African wild dogs, um, and in particular how they are impacted by climate change. Um, and then also, in a more general sense, um, whether nature-based tourism um, can continue to be a, a kind of good strategy for supporting conservation um, and the development of local communities uh, that live close to wildlife um, in light of the kind of climate change impacts uh, of long-haul travel. Um, but uh, rather than talking about wild dogs today, I'm going to be talking about uh, another very charismatic and iconic predator, um, perhaps the most charismatic and iconic of them all, um, and that is, of course, the tiger. And what I thought I'd do is spend a few minutes just at the beginning of this talk um, going over some more general aspects of tiger ecology, um, tiger classification, um, and how those relate to its conservation. Um, so the traditional wisdom would say that there are six currently existing, currently surviving tiger subspecies, uh, and three tiger subspecies that went extinct at various points in the 20th century. Um, so the living subspecies would be the Bengal tiger, um, found across uh, mostly in India, but also in neighbouring countries. Uh, the Siberian tiger, which is also known as the Amur tiger. Uh, traditionally, the Siberian tiger has been considered the largest of all tigers, um, although actually recent measurements have suggested that it is no larger than the tigers found in India today. So whether the kind of historical reports of extremely large Siberian tigers were exaggerated, or um, whether in fact Siberian tigers have really gotten smaller um, in the last century as a result perhaps of declining prey base or perhaps uh, poaching is unclear. But the Bengal tiger and the Siberian tiger uh, today are the, the joint largest tigers in existence. Um, we have Malayan tigers in the Malaysian peninsula, Indo-Chinese tiger um, across other parts of, uh, of Southeast Asia, uh, the South China tiger, which is now extinct in the wild, and the Sumatran tiger, um, which still exists in small numbers in little pockets of rainforest on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. Um, and then these three extinct subspecies. So the Caspian tiger, which once ranged across, um, so well, from parts of southeastern, um, uh, southeastern Turkey um, through Central Asia, uh, the Javan and then the Bali tiger, which uh, used to call those Indonesian islands home. Um, and if you look at this map of historical tiger distribution, or at least tiger distribution up until about 100 years ago, um, you can see that, yes, there are these uh, disconnected distributions of the Caspian tiger up in the top left. Um, and then down in the south, um, there are these, these tigers on Sumatra, Java and Bali. Uh, the vast majority of tigers up until about a century ago lived in one great continuous expanse 
uh, of distribution across a large chunk of mainland Asia from, from India in the south through Southeast Asia, all the way through China, up through the Korean Peninsula and up to the Russian Far East. And in fact, um, it's been shown through um, sort of biogeographical and genetic studies that uh, mainland tigers uh, should be considered a single subspecies, and that includes the Caspian tiger. Um, there's no reason genetically to separate them from one another. So that is now the official view that there are just two subspecies of tiger, uh, mainland tiger, and then the island tiger, which today is only represented um, by uh, the Sumatran tiger. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that uh, Caspian tigers and Amur tigers have been shown to be essentially genetically identical. Um, and there's even a suggestion that within five years, um, we might try and we might see some reintroductions of tigers to parts of their Central Asian range um, from which they've been extirpated for, for decades. But crucially, from a conservation point of view, um, and you can see that the remaining um, areas that tigers are still found are very distinct from one another. They're really very restricted to a, a few pockets of their formal range. And often those pockets have very different ecological conditions to other pockets that could be thousands of miles away. So um, uh, in functional conservation terms, tigers in different pockets are adapted to very different conditions and, and for functional conservation reasons should be treated as if they were still separate subspecies. Um, the, the variety of different conditions that, that tigers could survive and thrive in is really remarkable. Um, they, they live from the, sort of the dense, steamy uh, mangrove swamps of the Sundarbans on the India-Bangladesh border, uh, up to the arid thorn forests of Rajasthan in northwest India, and from the sort of dense, closed rainforests of Sumatra, uh, right up to the uh, birch, oak and pine woodlands of the Russian Far East where temperatures in winter can go as low as minus 40 degrees, a really harsh, very different environment for tigers to be, to be surviving in. But regardless of where they're found, uh, there are some really striking similarities between the things that, that tigers need to survive. And in particular, large prey are absolutely crucial to have um, a healthy breeding population of tigers. Um, throughout most of their range, um, that means large deer like Samba uh, and Wapiti up in the Far East, uh, and then crucially as well, wild boar. Um, where they coexist in, in South and Southeast Asia, um, large male tigers in particular uh, do like to take gore, which is the uh, largest wild cattle species in the world, uh, in the world with, uh, with big males sometimes weighing up to one and a half tons. Um, but it's only the largest male tigers that are able to, to take these guys. Um, and it's the availability of, of wild prey has an enormous impact on uh, tigers' ranging behaviour, you know, how much space they need, how far they go to find food. So up in the Far East, where um, prey density is very low, tigers could travel 20 kilometres in a single night to find food. Whereas in southern India, in Nagahole National Park, which is where so tiger prey density is the highest recorded, um, they might not need to travel any distance at all. And in fact, it's, it's been shown with studies that um, actually tigers in Nagahole basically just sit still all night waiting for prey to, to walk into their open mouth. There's, there's, so, much, there's so much prey available. Um, so very, very different behaviours. And given that the wider a tiger ranges, the more likely it is to come into contact with human threats, um, actually that kind of prey density has an enormous impact on how easy it is to conserve tigers effectively. Now, I mentioned they, pre they prefer large prey. Sometimes it simply isn't possible for them to get it. So, um, and that could be because they're existing in habitats that support naturally very low densities of large prey. Um, that, that's true in some rainforest environments. And it could be because, because humans have poached out most of those large prey animals. Um, but if you ever do find a tiger population that subsists largely on smaller prey items like this southern red muntjac, that is generally a sign that that tiger population is in a bit of trouble and is unlikely to be viable in the long term without some kind of conservation intervention. Um, and that in large part is because female tigers really do need to make a kill uh, of a large prey item at least once a week if they're to provide enough food for their growing cubs. Um, and it's been shown that, that populations of tigers that largely subsist on small prey have very low breeding success. Um, and although adults might survive, um, it's very difficult for them to replace their numbers um, to, maintain, to maintain a healthy population. 
Now, the areas of remaining tiger range where they, they exist in the highest densities as a result of very high prey densities tend to be central and southern India. Um, and then also these really rich uh, alluvial uh, forest grassland mosaics in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, and then the lowest densities uh, tend to be found up in the Russian Far East, um, which is a very naturally harsh environment, very naturally low prey densities. And then also some of these areas of Southeast Asia where tigers are just about still existing um, in places where humans have poached out almost all of their naturally occurring prey. Um, but regardless of the density at which tigers are living, they adopt a very similar social system. So uh, they have the classic feline uh, setup where females have relatively small territories, uh, just about large enough to give them all the resources they need to survive and to successfully raise young. And so those resources would mostly be food, uh, water and, and cover. Uh, the males, on the other hand, have these much, much larger territories, um, often encompassing the ranges of multiple females. Um, and that, that's much, much more than he would need just to feed himself. Um, he's after as many females as he can, as he can monopolize. And although in India, in particular, where tiger density is really high, you might get a female with a range of no more than 15 square kilometers, uh, in the Russian Far East, that could be 400 square kilometers. Uh, and a male dominant tiger out in Russia could have a range of as much as 1,500 square kilometers. Um, and to put that into some sort of context, Kana Tiger Reserve in India, one of India's largest, uh, is about 940 square kilometers in size less than two thirds of the size of just one adult male tiger's range in Russia. Uh, and I think that really emphasizes just how just how big the challenge is of conserving these these tigers out in out in that part of the world. Now, I hope that was interesting. Uh, I am going to move on now to, I suppose, what might be the, the more important question uh, of where you should go if you really want to see tigers in the wild for yourself. Now, for a very long time, uh, India was considered to be the only place on earth, really, where you had a realistic chance uh, of seeing a tiger in the wild. Um, there are approximately 4,000 tigers left in the wild on the planet, and just under 3,000 of those are in India. So in, in purely numerical terms, this really is the place to go. Um, and although, uh, as you'll see, as we'll see in a few minutes, it's not the only place to see tigers now, um, it remains by far the place with the, the most developed tiger watching infrastructure. Uh, and in particular, the central state of Madhya Pradesh, which is known as the Tiger State, um, it is probably the most reliable place to go um, in India. Um, it's home to some really fantastic tiger reserves, uh, Pench, Kana, uh, um, Bandavgarh, and a few others um, that I'll talk about briefly now. So Pench is this absolutely gorgeous forest. It's an open, largely an open teak woodland, and it's actually the area that inspired uh, Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. But from a tiger point of view, um, it's especially well known because of one particular tigress uh, known as Kola Wali. Um, she has that name because she used to have a radio collar. Um, photographers will be, will be pleased to hear that this collar has now come off. Um, but the reason for her fame is that she has now given birth to 29 uh, individual tiger cubs, which uh, is a record uh, as far as we know. And she's almost single handedly been responsible for boosting the tiger population of this particular reserve. Uh, this is a satellite image of this particular part of India. Um, so you can see down in the bottom left is Pench National Park and up in the top right is, is Kana. Um, both of these reserves independently would be fantastically important conservation refuges for tigers. But the, given that, as you can see, they are essentially connected by this amazing continuous band of forest, um, th this landscape represents one of our best hopes for successfully conserving tigers uh, long into the 21st century. And there are numerous records of, of tigers dispersing between these two reserves, and that genetic flow is going to be absolutely vital. Uh, but they are also uh, superb places to see tigers in the wild. Kana is an equally beautiful reserve to Pench, um, although it has a very different character. Um, unlike the teak forest of, uh, of Pench, it, it's mostly made up of this really wonderful old growth sal uh, woodland, these towering trees uh, interspersed with open grasslands uh, and lakes um, that support a really high density of tiger's prey and make for a really wonderful um, tiger viewing experience. 
Now, you'll be exploring, if you do go, um, these tiger reserves in these small 4x4s known as gypsies, um, and your guides will be looking out as you're traveling around for signs of tiger. Um, that could include pug marks like this one, um, recent signs of tiger activity, um, and also crucially, uh, sounds from the forest that indicate the presence of tiger. So this is cheetah or spotted deer, which is a hyper abundant prey species out in these central Indian forests. And they make a really, really um, distinctive high pitched sort of yelping sound, which I'm not going to attempt to impersonate now. Um, but they, uh, when they see a tiger, and so by listening out for these calls, you can often pinpoint the areas with recent tiger activity. And although getting a good tiger sighting can sometimes take a bit of patience, uh, you've got a fantastic chance in, in, this, in this kind of environment. Um, and you know, seeing one of these magnificent cats um, in these beautiful old forests, uh, it is always going to be worth whatever weight, whatever weight you have to put up with. Some fantastic other wildlife in Kana too, of course. Uh, and in fact, the reserve was gazetted, not for the tiger, but actually for this species, the, the Barasinga or uh, hard ground swamp deer. Um, back in the 1960s, there were perhaps only 60 or 70 individuals of this, this distinctive subspecies left in the wild. Um, and Kana was set up for their protection. Uh, there are now nearly a thousand. Um, so it's been a really fantastic conservation success story. Um, this is just a, a picture of a lesser adjutant stalk on the left and a, a sambar deer wallowing on the right, a wild boar and cheetle, a gore again, uh, this, this massive wild, wild cow, um, which, which is quite common to see in Kana, really spectacular animal. Um, this is dole or Indian wild dog. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I study African wild dogs in my, in my day job. I'm fascinated by these guys too. Uh, they have a very similar social system to African wild dogs, where it's primarily an alpha pair that, that monopolizes reproduction. Um, and the other members of the pack tend to help with the raising of the pups. Uh, and unfortunately for the dole, um, they have another similarity with African wild dogs, which is that they need a very large area, very large territory, um, both to find sufficient prey and to keep out of um, Keep, avoid the attentions of larger predators like tigers and leopards. Um, and in India, where availability of land for nature is, is much more tightly um, restricted than in Africa even, um, this means they often come into contact with humans, uh, human threats, domestic dogs and their diseases. Um, so disease outbreaks in particular uh, periodically devastate dole populations. Um, but there are parks, still a lot of these parks in central India are fantastic places to see them. Uh, leopard too is there. Um, often in some of these reserves, there might be more leopards than tigers, um, although it's sometimes difficult to, to believe that because they're much more elusive, but they are there. Um, this was, so I was in Kana a couple of years ago, um, and all morning we'd been hearing this massive male tiger roaring. We were really struggling to pin him down. So we parked by a fire break road with perhaps you know, four or five other vehicles, and we sat quietly waiting for about half an hour or so hoping that this tiger would come out of the, the bushes and, and give us a show. And eventually I, I jumped to my feet, pointing and sort of waving excitedly. Everyone else in all the vehicles around me gets up and is with bated breath waiting for this tiger to emerge. Uh, but it was just this, um, I just, not just, it was this beautiful Indian uh, paradise flycatcher, a gorgeous white morph bird, um, which I was delighted with, but I, I don't think I've ever had more uh, evil stares in my life. Um, and this, this perhaps sort of brings me on to one of the negative perceptions of some of these Indian parks, which is that they get really busy. Um, they can be a little bit busy sometimes, it's true. And you are, you know, although it's possible to have a sighting of a tiger to yourself, it does require a bit of luck. In my experience, though, these parks in general are very well managed. Um, and I, I, I've very rarely seen um, an example of any time where the animal's welfare has been, has been compromised. Um, but if, you, if, if avoiding the crowds is something you're really keen to do, then a reserve called Satpura, which is also in Madhya Pradesh, is a great, is a great option. Um, this, I think only 16 vehicles are allowed in the park at any one time, um, which means that you have a much, much greater chance of having very private sightings. Um, it's also a fantastic place to see sloth bear. Um, if you're really lucky, you might even see uh, the females with these gorgeous cubs uh, riding on their backs. Um, Satpura does also have uh, a rapidly growing tiger population, which is fantastic news if you want to see a tiger. Uh, not such great news if you want to see a sloth there, actually, because tigers do 
quite like eating them. Um, so if you want to see sloth bear in Sapporo, I'd, I'd recommend going as quickly as you can. Um, but the tigers are doing really well there and, and should continue to increase. I'll just mention very quickly some of the birds. Um, it'd be a shame to omit them completely. Um, this is Indian roller on the left, um, Indian gray hornbill on the right. Uh, Tickles blue flycatcher is a common woodland bird. Uh, stonking stalk billed kingfisher. Uh, orange orange headed thrush, uh, which is common in a lot of the gardens of the lodges that, that Nick's Trek tours tend to stay in. Um, and this, this is the brown fish owl. Tom, Tom showed you a picture of Buffy fish owl in Southeast Asia. This is a very close relative. Um, that's often seen at, at roost during the day in some of these parks. Um, when to go, um, I'll just quickly talk about this. So the traditional wisdom would say that the months leading up to the monsoon, which begins in June, uh, would be the best time to see tigers because as it gets hotter, they become more likely to spend the warmer parts of the day bathing in these pools. Um, there is some there is some sense in that, um, but really any time when the parks are open, which is between October and June, is a fantastic time to visit and you'll have a great chance of seeing tigers. Um, if you go a little bit earlier in the year, perhaps between October and early February, it'll be cooler, so it'll be a little bit more comfortable, less dusty, um, and the, the vegetation is much lusher, so it's a very different, much greener experience. But but in general, I think you know, there's, there are, um, there's no bad time to go. You'll have a great chance of seeing a tiger at any time. Now, I mentioned that India has been considered pretty much the only good place to see tigers. Um, until a few years ago, that was true. But recently, Nepal has been turning into uh, an increasingly reliable place to see tigers in the wild. Uh, and that's particularly focused around uh, Bardia National Park in the west uh, and Chitwan National Park in the center, um, just to the west of Kathmandu. These parks are both part of um, the Terai Arc landscape, which um, it's this really rich alluvial plain along the foothills of the Himalayas um, and is home to some of the highest densities of tigers in the world. Um, Nepal has been something of a tiger conservation success story in the last few years. So although the first census in 2009 only counted 121 tigers in the country, um, in, in fewer than 10 years, this had almost doubled to 235. Um, and about 180 of those tigers are split between these two reserves, Bardia and Chitwan. And so they are by far the best places in the country to see the big cat for yourself. And although the way that we explore uh, these parks on our next track tours is in some ways similar to India, um, a lot of the time you will be going out in jeeps on jeep safaris. Um, one of the wonderful things about Nepalese national parks is that they allow you to explore by boat and also on foot. And although just walking around the forest is unlikely to produce a sighting of a tiger, Actually, some of the best ways of seeing tigers in Nepal, particularly in Bardia, is to sit somewhere quietly at a viewpoint or perhaps behind a hide or blind. And we do on our, on our Nepal tours uh, use blinds. Wait at a viewpoint, looking out over a beautiful grassland or a lake and simply sit and wait and watch. Um, and quite often, increasingly often, that this is proving to be a really reliable way of, of seeing tigers, or increasingly so anyway. Um, and although that does mean that perhaps um, the tiger sightings are likely to be more distant than in India. Um, certainly the tigers aren't as well habituated as they are um, uh, in the country to the south. Um, but the plus side of that is that you are likely to be on your own when you see them, or at least not likely to be with people outside of your group. Um, and you have this opportunity to see tigers in these extraordinary landscapes in a totally peaceful setting, which, which can be quite a refreshing contrast to the slightly more hustle and bustle uh, of India. And again, um, I just say, so when to go. Uh, so Nature Trek does these tours to Nepal um, in October, November, and then in February. Um, the October trips are great to, for, a, for a chance of seeing tigers, but we do say that um, February is, is a better bet if tigers are your main priority. Um, because as in India, as it's getting a bit hotter, they tend to come down to these pools a bit more frequently. Um, and especially if you're sat at one of these viewpoints, there's a greater chance that a tiger might come, come down to, to bathe. And of course, these parks have a great variety of other wildlife too, uh, particularly some, some of this iconic megafauna, the Indian elephant, uh, Indian rhino, especially in Chitwan. Um, and then just, just finally, just to finish, um, if I were to do so, I, I, I would anticipate getting asked, you know, if you want to see tigers, should you go to India or should you go to Nepal? 
well, both have absolutely, you know, fantastic, unique appeal. Um, if you've never seen a tiger before and seeing one at all costs is your priority, then I would still pick India. You know, the infrastructure for watching tigers is more developed and they are more habituated to vehicles. You know, you have a, you have a better chance of, of seeing them there. But in Nepal, if you've, if you've seen tigers before in India or if you really are you know, totally averse to the idea of other, any other vehicles being around at all, then Nepal is a great bet. You know, you, you have a really good chance if you do see a tiger um, of having it completely to yourself. Um, uh, and again, in some of the most dramatic, beautiful settings uh, imaginable. Um, so I will. Uh, oh, I just finished. So uh, yes. So our tours, uh, the next trek tours to to India and Nepal, I think are hopefully going to resume uh, next month or certainly in the next few months. So um, definitely the time to start thinking about going in search of tigers if you haven't done so already. Um, I'll say thank you very much. Um, thanks for listening and. Um, yeah, please, if you have any questions, do uh, be very happy to answer them. Great stuff, Ben. Enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. It was great. <clears throat> oh, thanks, guys. All, all, yours, all yours are fantastic, too. Yeah, maybe you want to travel again. <laughs> <laughs> i get back to India. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That's mouth-watering stuff, really. Um, and absolutely, you hit the nail on the head there. Now is the time um, to start booking and, and looking ahead. Um, absolutely. Um, brilliant. So uh, we have uh, we've had some questions come in, uh, and I think we've got we've got a bit of time to answer them. Um, so thank you everybody for sending in uh, those questions, and if you've got any more, please do send them in. Um, so uh, just uh, a couple of, kind of um, questions related to the talks we've had. Um, Paul, are there uh, wild dogs in Kruger? Well, actually, I was going to pass that over to Ben since he studies wild dogs <laughs> in a better position to answer that one than me. <laughs> uh, sure. Yes, there are wild dogs in Kruger. And, and in fact, it's, it's, um, it is one of the larger populations that still exists. So... Um, there are roughly 300 of them now, um, and if you consider there are no populations left that, that reach into the thousands, um, it is a fantastic place to see them actually. So most of my own best sightings of wild dogs uh, have been in Kruger, and I think because the way most of our the next trek tours there work is that you, you can cover quite a lot of ground on the, the public road network in Kruger. Uh, actually, if, if anything, it gives you a sometimes a better chance of tracking them down because they're so wide ranging themselves. If you can be wide ranging as well. Um, and if you're at a small private lodge, sometimes you're a bit more restricted in your movements. I, I've always found Kruger to be a fantastic place to see them. And the, the conservation work that's going on there with some people that I've worked with myself, um, are, they're, they're doing a fantastic job and oh, their numbers are increasing. Maybe to have lost Ben? Oh. oh. Well, maybe, oh maybe that was me. We might have lost you, Paul. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe it's me. I'll, 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 I'll go quiet. <laughs> I hope, I, hope, I hope everyone could hear me. Um, I could hear myself anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we could. I think we could. Okay, um, are, you, are you able to give a little insight um, into um, your studies to date uh, in terms of um, wildlife tourism uh, and how they have impacted uh, the wild dogs? Presume positive, negative? Yeah, yeah, no, I'd, I'd be very happy to. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm still partly because of COVID. I haven't been able to get out and do any field work yet. I'm, I'm expecting to spend a good chunk of next year out, out in the field, which I'm very excited about. But I, I mean, I mean, I speak to, to conservationists all the time. And, and, and I think the, the thing that, again, I don't want to prejudice, you know, prejudge the results of my work too much, but you know, what they all say is that the result, you know, the absence of tourism has been utterly devastating for conservation efforts, you know, not just in Africa, not just for wild dogs, but, but for, for species and landscapes the world over. And, you know, I, I, I think it is absolutely right that a lot of people are considering the impact of the travel that they do. Um, we should all be doing that. Um, the fact of the matter is that it, it seems abundantly clear to me from the work I've done so far that if ecotourism, wildlife tourism were to disappear overnight, we would lose a huge amount of the very you know, environment that we're hoping to protect. Um, and so I, all I would say in terms of that so far is that you know, there are forms of travel I think people should continue to be proud to be involved with. And yes, do the research. Yes, work out 
what is impactful and sometimes there might be trips that aren't worth going on um, but everyone at Nature Trek I, that I in my experience is incredibly dedicated to conservation I don't believe that you know they would be sending people on these trips if we didn't if we didn't believe that they're making a positive impact on the species that you're going to see um, and I think although again the motivation to cut back on on flying for environmental reasons is is, is a very good one and, and a very noble one and should be done you know, we should cut back on flying in the right circumstances um, I, I think you know we would lose far we would lose a huge amount that we value if we if we gave up on on ecotourism and I, I know that I know that most conservationists I talk to feel exactly the same as do members and representatives of local community groups um, I, hope, I hope that kind of provides some some background that that's 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 not, I mean, that's not just my personal opinion. That is genuinely the, 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 the you know, what I see from talking to people um, and, and doing, and doing this work myself. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's absolutely the, the belief um, and thoughts that, that we have at Nature Trek as well. Um, absolutely. And it's um, obviously a topical subject at the moment with what's going on um, up in Glasgow uh, and we have had a few people ask about um, the carbon footprint um, and what you know what can Nature Track do about it um, so we are um, going to be looking to do uh, longer long haul trips so maybe um, you're traveling to a faraway destination rather than going, than going on two long haul trips in a year, you take just one long one um, to, to save on, on the uh, carbon from those flights. Um, we are looking to do um, more European tours with train and, and ferry options as well. Um, so do keep a, an eye out for that. Um, uh, a question from, from Nikki Brooks. Um, I think carbon offsetting is a bit unreliable in terms of its impact, uh, but was wondering if Nature Track is able to recommend any particular scheme. Um, we, I, I don't think we can, but um, we, we do kind of echo your sentiments in that uh, carbon offsetting schemes, then they're probably not really fit for purpose um, and a bit of a gimmick, really. Um, what we have been doing for many years now um, is for each one of our clients who, who takes the flights with us. Um, we put money into a pot and we use that money to purchase uh, cloud forest in Ecuador. And we have uh, our own reserve, uh, which connects to national parks up there. Uh, and we're creating a wildlife corridor. Uh, so if you take a holiday with us, um, you can also make your own contribution towards that it's not carbon offsetting but actually we think it's better than that because we're preserving what's already there um, uh, as well as the biodiversity as well um, so we would absolutely recommend that even if you're flying um, and not taking a holiday through nature track you're more than welcome uh, to offset your flight through us by making a donation absolutely fine um, okay um tom we had a question um about oh, about mosquitoes out in brazil yeah. and now are they prevalent um well you'd think the world's largest wetlands are going to be swarms of mosquitoes everywhere but thankfully it's not the case in the time of year that we visit um the, the season for visiting the pantanal is is their dry season so from from june through sort of mid-november and there's surprisingly few few mosquitoes i mean my visits there i've you know there's the, there's the old one or two around but i must admit i've i've, I've had more mozzie problems in my my room in uh, in, in Cheltenham than having the pantanal in, in all honesty there, there, there are some around but it's more you know wandering in long grasses for other little you know biting insects where you, know, you wear your long trousers your, your long sleeves you take insect repellent of course but really don't be you know, don't be put off by the thought of, mo of mosquitoes. They're, they're obviously extremely prevalent in the wet season, but um, we're not there then. So no, they're in a nutshell, they're nothing to be to be concerned about. Just take okay. precautions. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good. Um, another question for you, Tom, uh, from Roger. Mm. Roger Toll. Thanks for this. This is a good one. Um, past trip reports mentioned that Puma is coming very close at times. On a one to ten scale, with one being "I'm a pussycat" and ten being "I'm going to eat you," how would you rate these encounters? 
brilliant, yeah. brilliant question. Yeah, yeah very well put. I love that one. <laughs> um, you can get very, very close encounters. So I would, you know, I, when I was when I was over there, I might be up at around the eight, or, you know, eight or nine on that scale. Um, there's no, no reason to be scared at all. But sometimes when you are track, you know, you're you're tracking them on foot. Um, occasionally they will wander closer than you think, or be in the grass. That that photo I showed of the animal in, in, in the grass that was you know that was only sort of you know, 15 odd meters away very 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 close but they they, they will move naturally away we stay you know, we stay a, a, you know a, a very respectable distance and there, there's no reason to be scared but you can get some incredibly close views there's no doubt about that yeah brilliant excellent um okay uh Maya's asked a question when will snow leopard and clouded leopard tours resume um i know snow leopard in mongolia um we do have a couple of departures scheduled for august next year um and it's just a case of waiting and see um what the situations like in mongolia and their entry requirements and whatnot um whilst the uk government says the world is open for travel uh, and it certainly is compared to uh, a month ago not everywhere is just yet um so and that's the, the case with mongolia so there is a, it's a case of waiting yeah. to see um but for, the, for borneo tom yeah that's the case with borneo unfortunately they're still not 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 allowing us in at the moment where there's the, there's rumors that hopefully you know early in the new year we will we will relax talking to talking to you know guides over there so fingers crossed you know 2022 we'll be getting our trips up and running again but currently i mean it's still an issue but um yeah we're, we're very hopeful that, that next year the, the tours will be up and running and we've got a good got a great season lined up yeah great excellent um and Anne uh, asking about um the nepal mammal tour um yes we will have some more planned i don't know if we'll be running another one next year but certainly in 23 we we will be um so do do keep an eye out for that if um dates for for next year don't suit um another wild dogs question ben well oh, quite a, uh, a particular one uh, are there still wild dogs in the salu? Uh, yes, there are. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> wild, wild dogs. Yeah. So this, the Salu has, has traditionally been like, the largest single reserve population um, of wild dogs. So they are still there. Although there are um, there's a, there's a threat posed by this big dam building project. Um, but they, I, I expect that they will persist there, but, but potentially in slightly reduced numbers. No, but it remains a very important centre for them. Uh, and I know there are nature trek tours that. That go there that have a good a good um, success rate of finding them too excellent good thank you very much for that um claire uh claire thanks for your question asking if we can do uh, another presentation but this time on small cats obviously we we have touched on quite a few of those this evening but um that's certainly something we'll consider um just to say uh, online presentations uh, i think are going to be here to say obviously we've got um a whole load still the rest of this year and we'll be doing some more uh, at the beginning of next year as well um we're always open to to new ideas um so thanks for that um yeah and, and, and with the with, with, with the palaces cat mentioned there i know that palaces cat have been seen on our mongolia snow leopards tour so you know they they're there as well palaces cat in the same in the same um, environment so yeah, there's a chance and the, and the local guides will be on the lookout for them um, and, and fingers crossed for that so you'll be you're not just focusing solely on, on snow leopard but chance of palaces cut as well and others okay great thanks tom um okay so uh paul um how successful are we uh on seeing caracal um, well, we've had a couple of our uh, groups down in in the Cape over the years see Caracal really more more by my by charts. Um, we've not managed to run one of our Caracal trips, de dedicated Caracal trips yet because of the pandemic. We had the, the first tour was due to go out um, last year, um, and of course that that was cancelled, and then the one this year was cancelled as well. So we've got a trip planned now for July 2022. Um, we've been working with the local guides down in South Africa, so you know, they're, they're, they're not an easy species to see. They're elusive, but we'll try our best and we'll certainly be taking the group to the 
um, to some of the, the best areas for Caracal and we'll keep our keep our fingers crossed. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, right. I, I think that's that's all the questions we've had. Um, but just to say, um, we've obviously we, we've received lots of lovely comments from you as well. Um, and it sounds like you've really enjoyed this evening. Um, so thank you very much for for letting us know that you have enjoyed it. Um, and looking forward to to your holidays with us, um, Carol. Carol Wood. Yes, we're looking forward to you traveling with us for the first time. Third time lucky. We'll keep fingers crossed for you there. Um, so yeah, chaps. Paul, Tom, Ben, thank you ever so much um, for talking with us this evening. Um, and of course, a very big thank you to all of you at home for joining us as well. I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, our next uh, road show is a couple of weeks time, I think Tuesday, 16th of November. Um, and that will be about uh, Scottish uh, wildlife. So uh, something a little bit different there, but just as interesting and fascinating. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. Um, also, if you are available midday tomorrow, uh, you can join Paul and myself on a virtual tour uh, in Costa Rica um, at a new location uh, we haven't been to before. We're looking forward to that one. Uh, so do join us for that as well. Um, right, okay, unless anybody has anything else to say, um i think that is it thank you very much again for joining us um good night and we'll see you again soon yeah thank you bye-bye thank, thank you everyone thank you for joining us thank you bye-bye